Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Beyond Y2K. Today, we're going to be talking about understanding the impact of date bugs in computing from Y2K to Y2K38 and beyond. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Mark Vanderplug. I've been working on computer software uh, development, design, and architecture uh, since the early 1980s. I started out uh, on a Commodore 64. I developed a accounting and bookkeeping system and payroll system for a construction company. I taught myself how to use the basic programming languages, and I used the Commodore 64 and, and floppy drive. Uh, the com you see a Commodore 64 and a floppy drive behind me. In 1985, I began my real career with EDS, Electronic Data Systems, a company started by Ross Perot in the late 60s, early 70s. I got involved in a system that did healthcare claim adjudication, and I've essentially been working on that same system ever since for the last 40 years. Uh, it's been cloned and copied, and it's been utilized across uh, several different companies, and I'm not real sure the extent to which some of the software components that I've been working on for the last 40 years have been propagated across other industries and across other computer software systems. For those of you who can remember, with the Y2K problem, computer systems rely on date storage and for essential functions. Historical design choices have led to several major date-related issues. This presentation explores Y2K, Y2K38, and a lesser known Y2K29 problem. Many computer software systems store years using only two digits. That was prior to 2000. This made 2000 indistinguishable from 1900, causing a potential system failure. There were predictions that this was gonna cost the IT industry anywhere from 400 million to 800, 400 million to 800 billion to remediate. And the public reaction was panic. People decided to store stockpile food and thinking that could be the end of the world or anyway, had a lot of fiscal fears. And the ultimate outcome was that there were many minimal disruptions due to the extensive remediation efforts that were put in uh, during that time. And I was part of that. I worked on the system I worked on. I worked uh, numerous hours trying to remediate the Y2K bug, a lot of testing, integration, and uh, deployment of the changes that were needed to ensure that there was a soft transition from the 1900s to 2000. And that's kind of how the Y2K problem was solved. There was extensive audits and code rewrites. Governments and corporations invested heavily in fixing the issue. Uh, Bill Clinton, the president at the time, called it the first challenge of the 21st century, uh, successfully met. Uh, global IT teams prevented significant failures. And like I said, I was part of a team that, uh, that remediated the code in the system that I was working on at the time. There's another challenge coming up, and this is why it's called Y2K and Beyond, because in uh, 2038, there's going to be another problem that's going to raise its head, and that's related to the Unix system, Unix time system, which counts the number of seconds from January 1st, 1970. And the way they store that number of seconds since January 1st, 1970, is it's, it'll reach a maximum value on January 19th, uh, 2038. And because of that, it will revert all the way back to December 13th, 1901, causing uh, potential failures. The most vulnerable systems are the legacy systems that were developed primarily in the late 70s and early 80s. And uh, critical infrastructure could experience failures. Modern, system, modern systems now use 64-bit storage that will prevent the overflow for billions of years. The issue is uh, that since they were only using 32-bit storage before this, there you have to expand your data in order to accommodate uh, the increased number of uh, what's called bytes to store those fields. So there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of records throughout the industry that have dates stored in 32-bit storage instead of 64-bit. Now going forward to the Y29 problem, and this is the problem I'm actually making this episode of Beyond Y2K, is to make people aware of the issue that's uh, looming in the future for the year 1929. Because the system I've been working on for the past 40 years has a date algorithm that stores dates as 
16 bits or two bytes for those of you who are technical. And the days, the there's an epoch date of January 1st, 1940. The epoch date is the date that's represented by the number zero. Any date after that is represented by a positive number, and any date before that is represented by a negative number. And with two bytes, you can you can represent 65k or 65,000 unique values. So 65,000 days are represented by those two bytes. Half of those would be positive and half of those negative. So 32,000 or 32k positive and 32k negative. And that 32, that 65k then it turns out can represent just short of 180 years. So for the systems that I've been working on for the last 40 years, that date is going to be on September 17th, 2029. That's the maximum positive date that you can represent with a signed half word. So the day after that uh, will turn negative if you add if you add one to that, and it'll revert to a ne negative number because the field, the two bytes are signed and it'll revert all the way back to a date in 1850. I believe it's April uh, 14th of 1850 is what that will represent. So what that means to banking industry and everything is, you know, all of a sudden you're going to be calculating interest based on a year in the night in the 1800s instead of the 2000s. Same with healthcare and other industries. Instead of representing dates beyond September 17th, 2029, properly those, those, the representation of those as a half word is going to be revert all the way back to the 1800s. Several of the systems I worked on have their genesis all the way back in the early 1970s when Ross Perot became very involved in the IT industry and produced a lot of software systems. He got his foot in the door through processing healthcare claims for Medicare and Medicaid, which was uh, government funding. It's very common in the software industry for companies to uh, clone one functioning system to create a system for a new client. And this is what EDS uh, did quite frequently in uh, the 70s and 80s. The system I am working on uses a utility called WASDATE. WASDATE was uh, developed by EDS in the early 70s, I believe. I'm not 100% sure of uh, the complete origin of it, uh, but I have noticed that WASDATE has also been uh, cloned and pirated and renamed by other software companies kind of to hide the origin of it. So it's unknown at this time exactly what the uh, impact and, and the prevalence of the uh, WASDATE is and this problem with using a binary half word as the epoch date, or an epoch date is the date that system software engineers use um, to keep track of dates. In this case, they use January 1st, 1940, and that, that is zero. And every day after January 1st, 1940 is a positive number and every represented by a positive number and every day prior to January 1st, 1940 is represented by a negative number. COBOL is extremely pervasive within the IT industry. It makes up a numerous billions of lines of code. COBOL requires source code to be, rec to be compiled to generate object code. The object code is then what actually is executed. So the source codes for some of these COBOL systems was developed way back in the 1970s and maybe all the way into the 1980s, in some cases using uh, what's called punch cards. And those punch cards were just a deck of cards that uh, they had a machine where you punched in the different things that you that then was fed into a machine that translated those the information on those punch cards into the object code that's still executing today in many of these systems. So the source code is probably no longer in existence or at least lost and um, may not even be able to be maintained anymore. But the object code has been running fine for decades. And so remediating the problem related to the Y29 issue could be almost more extensive than the Y2K problem that we had going from 1900 to 2000. The IT industry is constantly working on modernization. I remember back in the early 1980s already that uh, everybody was saying, well, COBOL is going away. It's not going to be, it's not the language, COBOL programming language of the future. But 
COBOL has not gone away. People are still developing applications with uh, COBOL and maintaining COBOL applications and adding new functions and features to those. So COBOL will probably be around for an extended period of time because it's so pervasive throughout the IT industry. Modernizing the systems can be extremely expensive and time-consuming. Companies should proactively identify and update vulnerable code, but that takes time and money, and a lot of times they just wait till the last minute. Even with the Y2K problem, companies waited until the late or mid to late 1990s to really uh, get on board with making the changes. So it was kind of a scramble to get everything remediated uh, in time for <clears throat> the year 2000. What can we learn from these types of issues with uh, dates and times within the IT industry? Early inter intervention can prevent uh, major disruptions. Software longevity must account for uh, future dates. Way back in the 1970s, 1980s, when people were doing everything they could to save on storage by representing days in with just two bytes, they didn't foresee the possibility that the systems they were developing in would actually still be functioning and running in the, the 2000s and beyond. So either they didn't think they would be functioning or they figured they were gonna no longer be alive anyway, so what's the big problem? We'll just put this in here and uh, we might get a bonus because we've saved all these all this storage just by representing dates with uh, with two bytes instead of taking up a lot of storage with uh, with dates because dates are pervasive they're everywhere they're in you know the dates of service on healthcare claims your birthday you know date your everything's effective all those types of things so all the industries uh, across the the world are using using dates and their dates are embedded in and stored in billions and billions and billions of uh, files of uh, records th throughout uh, the world. Y2K was a wake up call. Y2K38 and Y2K29 reinforced the need for long term IT planning. IT software engineers have to think beyond their own lifespan because the systems they're creating may very well be uh, functioning for decades, if not centuries, after they develop them. Here at Beyond Y2K, we are interested in getting word out about the looming possibility that there may be a serious date issue going into uh, 2029 and beyond. And thank you for your time. And just feel free to leave comments and questions and uh, as they arise. See you next time on Beyond Y2K. Thank you.